Boop. Alrighty. I will play the music. Go for it. Hello, everyone. Whether you're listening now or later to what I'm now calling the Pitchy and Pals cast until I can come up with a better name. This is the third show we'll be doing. I do not have my previous guests of Javi, Fire Rider, or Hunter Stephen from Queensland. Instead, this week's guest shall be South Australia's very own Giggles 454, proudly sponsored by ESG. Hello, hello. Let's get that text up. There we are. <laughs> Number one Australian Blaze Blue player himself, Grand Champion of that's Battle true, Arena true. Melbourne, here with me to actually not talk about Blaze Blue at all, most likely. <laughs> Uh, number two Guilty Gear player as well, right? <laughs> uh, no, well, Ando is... Oh, I guess so. The... Yeah, after all, Ando is the num- <laughs> yeah, Ando is the number one player by virtue of being the highest placing non-Japanese person at BAM. And... Exactly. I One of the closing topics of last time's show, a fortnight ago, was how there's a lot of fighting games coming out. There's Guilty Gear Rev 2, there's oh, Tekken boy, 7... There's Injustice 2, there's the PC version of KOF 14, and so and the update for Street Fighter 5. Well, pretty much all of those have come out now, so one of the things I'd like to talk about this week, that we'll get to at some point, is learning Tekken 7 from an anime player's perspective, because Giggles here has decided to learn <laughs> Tekken. Giving it a shot, yeah. Not, not so easy, but, you know, it's good fun, the learning experience, yeah. We'll get to that later, though. Yeah, well, we can either talk about Tekken now or later. I can run through the list of general topics I've got here in my notes. So, first thing I'll get across fairly quickly is just KOF 14's current state, which is the PC release isn't actually out, but if you pre-order, you can take part of some very extensive beta testing that's going on which is very useful because it's very clear that SNK doesn't know what they're doing with PC development and are very much learning things (laughs) as they go. One of the things in particular that strikes me with the test so far is that it's clear that they haven't got very good tools for handling a wide variety of input devices, whether they aren't using the libraries like X-Input and Direct Input. I don't know. It seems every patch like they're putting in specific exceptions to recognize specifically identified drivers for input devices. So, and this kind of makes sense since all the previous SNK ports were handled by either .mu or by, think about Bob, Codemasters? Code Mystics, um, that's it. Yeah, I was just about to ask you about that because when you said they're clearly inexperienced, I was about to call you out and say, but surely this dev uh, ported quite a lot of games onto Steam. I know. Uh, They've basically always been outsourced for the PC ports to either Code uh, Mystics or .mu. I see. So this is the first time they're, so they're really, it really the learning it. It's a bit like, say, when From Software started porting things to the PC and the complete madness that was like the Dark Souls <laughs> 1 port. And then you look at how amazingly optimized Dark Souls 2 is when they realize what they can actually do now that they've got free reign. So mm. I think the final product for 14 will wind up being pretty cool and breathe some extra life into a pretty fun game. But for the moment, if you're buying it, expecting to immediately just jump in, it's going to be a bit hairy for the moment. And they do like the feedback. If you are Mm. buying into that, please send as much feedback as you can because it'll make the final product that much better. That's it for KOF. And is there an estimated release date for the full version? I think it's like July or something. Let me check. King of Fighters 14 on mm, PC. Yes. You haven't played much 14, have you? No, I've, I've played a bit when it first came out, um, <laughs> back in the Nakaruri days. <laughs> oh yeah, you sang along to the theme song, oh, boy, I certainly remember that. that. Character. Um, so I played Nakaruru, yeah, Nakaruru, Sleepy Kid, and um, Ramon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I played it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but... I know, there's a lot of fighting games. <laughs> yes, there certainly are, and certainly at local meetings, it's mostly just been A1 and Rob hitting buttons, and they've hit the point where Rob's starting to fire up things like KOF 11 and Kizuna Encounter again. So, <laughs> and 
I was speaking to Wei Wan on I, Sunday. I think, um, and he, I, I was going to say, I think when uh, COV-14 came out earlier, that was just before BBCF came out. Yes. I, feel, I think that was the reason I stopped playing it. I think that was it. Anyway, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> A1 is probably... A1's not sure if he's going to OHN yet, but he's decided that if he does go, he's just going to see what wacky team he can get away with and just see how he can do playing, like, <laughs> Ralph, Rio, and... I'm trying to remember who he had on point. Oh, yeah, Xanadu. Xanadu, Ralph, Rio. <laughs> okay, how fa <laughs> How much Wahoo can I get away with? How uh, He actually has, on the tall characters, this really, really grimy mix-up with Ralph, where you get them to block, then you do max activation into the EX explosion kick thing, and it will sometimes cross up. Oh, yeah. He hit me with that and went, what the <laughs> hell is that? <laughs> oh, that's good. Wait, who are you playing that was big? Uh, Daimon. Ah, uh, okay. My boy. So, that's currently the state of South Australian KOF. Check things out. Shall we talk about Guilty Gear before we move into Tekken Talk? Or do we want to do Tekken first, then Let's move into it. Guilty Gear? Let's get GG over and done with. Alrighty, so, Rev 2 came out. It's pretty sweet. The main problem is a lot of the Australian community is currently using the PC version of the game. It's very fun. Whoa, shoutouts to Adamar, my good friend from Largs North, who's been learning fighting games over the last month or so. But we need to talk about the current netplay situation where we had quite a lot of people playing pretty much every night. And on top of all these new fighting games coming out and these big updates, one of the big problems is Rev2 has somewhat broken the netplay. I haven't been able to play much, but my connections are not good when it happens, so it's clear that whether it's just the way that they've reworked their lobbies or some sort of tweaks they've done to try and optimize things, currently PC netplay is not very good for Australians. And it's hurting things that much more in addition to all the new releases. So hold tight, talk to each other. Which is... A... Um, I was going to say, it's a shame because they really they hit it uh, hit it on the head with uh, Rev1. That was some of the best netplay I've ever played. And uh, played. And I'm certainly not a netplay fan in the slightest. But I, uh, I've put my time in with a bit of Rev1 netplay, um, especially leading up to BAM. Yes. Uh, I was grinding it out a bit for a couple of weeks leading up to yeah. Yeah, pretty much every night there's a big bun there's an Australian lobby and people jumping in and playing. And so hopefully we can hold tight and this gets resolved pretty quickly. Because I think that it's one of the things that's really helping a lot of our mid tier players move up and just have that all round better fundamental strength at playing Guilty Gear. Because while you can't do perfect play online, obviously, there's always gonna be lag spikes. There's always going to be that bit more frame delay than usual. There's going to be certain tactics that you can get away with as a result, but there's a lot more better decision-making for the most part happening, I feel, because the people who want to win online are having to learn that much more pragmatic style of play. Mm, very true. Otherwise, next things to talk about of Rev2 is there's two new characters, Biken and Answer. What are your feelings on Biken and Answer as the number two Australian Guilty Gear player, Alex? Well, what are my feelings? Yes. Um, I've messed around with them a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, like when the when the demo was out. Answer's combos were a bit hard. <laughs> I was going to give him a shot. So actually, uh, a bit of backstory. Um, before I actually got my hands on Rev2 and I'd only seen the changes and whatnot, I, uh, and Answer was looking very strong in the arcades. I think we could all agree on that. Um... I, I was thinking of switching away from Sin because I thought, you know, I, I'm sick of playing this character. He's, he's gotten nerfed like three times now. Like, mm. I don't want to put up with that anymore. I'm going to switch to Answer. You're sick of being uh, the Akuma of this game. I got my game. hands on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Answer was kind of awkward and hard. And I was like, oh dear. <laughs> um, and not only that, I, I think Sin might have gotten buffed. Uh, I still haven't learned all the new routes, but I, I think he's still really, really strong. 
Um, the the stabby stab buff alone is really good. Uh, hundred hand for those who haven't seen it, the hundred hand slap, the big rapid stabs thing, that now knocks down, which allows for these really 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 easy anywhere on screen. Did big driver hit? I'll just mash the button as a hit confirm, and it may yeah. not be optimal, but I knocked him down and I get to eat afterwards, and that's surprisingly good for him. Um. Yeah. 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 Uh, you get it off these like really far S and two uh, S, um, yes. like max range confirms when uh, nothing else would hit normally because you'd previously do I don't know that into beat driver slide and the slide wouldn't connect because it's too far. Yes, um, or you wouldn't get the just frame DP. Um, the the full mash is a lot more expensive now. They they increase the mm. damage, which is amazing, uh, <laughs> but um, it's quite expensive now in terms of food. Um, but one thing it's it's kind of interesting in that regard because you have to manage your food in neutral a bit if you want to rely on that confirm. Yep. Um, so it costs 6,000 calories, which and you start with 10,000, by the way. Yes. Uh, so it leaves you, you can do three special moves in neutral, and then the next one has to be, if you want to like still uh, have the stabby stab in mind. Um, so that's pretty interesting. I Because um, it's hard to visually judge if you look at the bar, because uh, there aren't really any segments when you have 6K calories left. So you just kind of keep in your mind, I've used three special moves, okay, uh, I still can do the stabby stab, yeah. Yeah. It's the sort of, it's the sort of extra level of resource management that I like to see, because it still rewards a certain amount of improvisation, but also very much rewards the situational awareness, and to a certain extent I think Sin needed to have a bit more micromanagement, just because a lot of his, <laughs> a lot of his visual play against the opponent is so... Eat. I, I guess I could be like derisive and say brain dead, but yeah, it is a fairly straightforward game of just my fire S, my it 2S, is. and my big driver control so much horizontal space. So having to make sure that you're thinking about something else at the same time is something that benefits him, I think, for making a better designed character. Mm. Sort of like how I like to say Accent yeah. Cormelia has the super wacky, super specific combo routes, like Java used to have the big pile of flashcards to remind him what the combo route was for each character. And I felt that that was okay, since Millie is such a one-player character that you might as well go all the way and make mm. her just nothing but cramming for exams. And a bit of that, I think, is suitable <laughs> for Sin's design. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely an interesting new facet to his uh, gameplay. Um, but other than that with Sin, I just have to figure out those new corner, like beak winder combos, I suppose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Climb the stairway of big and drivers. And also, uh, not having... Yeah, yeah. Air-to-air -air confirms I don't know what to do currently because you get the jump P, blah, 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 jump P, 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 S, and then big driver doesn't knock down. So yeah. I'm not sure. I guess I can do jump T. Mm, I'll have to mess around with that. Yeah. The thing is, you could even just build your game plan more heavily around just, like, tech trapping off of your air combos because Sin's tech trap game is yeah, so that's good. Yeah, I've been trying. <laughs> Like, Jump H yes. is pretty amazing. And 6P. Yes. 6P as well, <laughs> but I mean, like, Jump that. H is a way less risky thing to be using in tech traps. It's, you're either going to get an air throw, or you're going to get that Smash Brothers neutral air. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and as for Biken, uh, my thoughts on her, um, she's she's okay. I don't I, I yeah. really... <laughs> I've played a fair bit against Colin's fairly rudimentary uh, Biken. Um, yeah, he's not he's confirming not off Gunner hit to H still. No, yeah, and but he's he's got a decent idea of the neutral game at least. Mm. Um, and I I don't find it very challenging <laughs> for no. Sin, honestly. Uh, so if she wants to dash around in the air and throw tatamis, that's fine with me. Big driver, blow it up. Oh no, like um, that is not what you want to do with it. is slightly concerning on the ground. Yes. 2H but, um, low profile's big driver for memory. It does, which is very important in that matchup. But uh, yep. Sin can 3K it, so he's got stuff. Yes. Um, yeah. Otherwise, Bai can. I don't know. Yeah, she's, she's okay, good. <laughs> she's good. Dot 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 characters? with that with that lilting tone. She's good. That that is exactly how I would mm. describe Bai can at this yeah. point. <laughs> I kind of feel it's intentional, because. They decided to rework her guard cancels, knowing what a nuisance they were in old games. So, this time they decided to heavily rework the guard cancels, make her a flat-out parry character with canned follow-ups. I really like mm. that they maintain one of the parry follow-ups having 
invulnerability and it being good old Sakura, the big horizontal swipe, I really like the counter hit properties on that move. It ground slams, it yeah, it tumbles mid screen and wall splats in the corner. So you always get cool stuff off it. Which one is that one? The horizontal stab. What's the which? What's the button? S. Oh, the S follow up. S follow up. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I like that that's invol, whereas the uppercut is actually just the really fast punish one. So I like the variety that there is in the follow ups. Mm -hmm. I really like the parries how they currently work, but the guard cancels themselves. Uh, rubbish, <laughs> to be blunt. They... Yeah, I, I honestly don't understand how the guard cancels work. <laughs> it's They seem terrible. Okay, so it, how it works is sort of like how shadow counters work in Killer Instinct, where when you are in block stun, you then hit input the move, and it will take you out of block stun and put you in the parry stance. But the active window is a very, very small window that will strike the next thing that hits if you timed it correctly. So it's about... So it's a guard cancel that's anticipating that you'll parry the next hit in the string, but unlike mm, shadow counters in Killer Instinct, which have a fairly large like window, like in Killer Instinct, if you're doing, say, brain, brain dead two hit normals and the like, then shadow counters will work. Mm -hmm. But if it's like mashing, crouching, light kick, that's too fast for the shadow counter. In Biken's case, oh, the yeah. window is really, really tiny, so it's more like timing a red parry in third strike. Mm. I feel that the idea here was, we know that Biken can be really obnoxious based on previous games, so I feel like since it's working with an idea they've already had, that they intentionally made it weaker with the idea that if this isn't being utilized at all in her game plan, then we will buff it a bit in, a, in an inevitable patch. I feel like, much like last year, there's going to be a patch after Evo. That seems the logical time to do a big balance update, and I yes. think... That they I, will buff the guard I cancel then. Agree. As for answer, yeah, that seems like a fairly good time, um, considering uh, how it just released. Give it what? What is it? Two months um, from the release to Evo? Oh yeah, it'll be two yeah, months yeah, from right console's right. release to Evo, and they've already had like a month and a mm. half, like six weeks before that of time in Japan to uh, with yeah, the top level players at the arcades so they should have a pretty good idea of what's sensible and not sensible to do mm. and most of the changes have been pretty reasonable so far we can argue till the cows come home about whether soul deserved his almighty standing kick to have its startup increased from three frames to five frames but soul now gets Suck it, soul players soul gets soul gets an accent core move in a game that is still somewhat slashish <laughs> in its design at the moment, and Soul just has oh, the, revolver. Yeah, the the Accent Core Air Bandit Revolver for the yeah. world's easiest nonsense yeah. knockdowns and corner carry off everything now. Hmm. Prods is expecting a BV patch um, at Evo. Yeah, I agree. Back. That'll happen too. Um, um, sorry, I was going to ask um before we go on to answer or your thoughts on answer. Uh, do you think, what do you think will happen for DLC for this? Do you think it'll be like uh, at Evo, then another Dizzy kind of timing? Yeah, I reckon, a, I reckon at Evo, yeah, I reckon at Evo they will announce a balance patch, which is happening immediately, and another character like they did with Dizzy. It mm -hmm. got a lot of attention, it made everyone very happy with the product, it and did. that seems like, oh. like I reckon possibly in the weeks leading up to Evo they might do the next story mode patch. And that might have like a bunch of focus on Robokai or something. Uh... And go, look out, Robokai's coming. And then after Evo, Robokai's here. Yes. Mm. Steven's remarking there's Sounds a good. sus yeah, yeah. yeah. Steven's remarking there's a very sus spot right in the middle of the character select screen, yes. There's also that really obnoxious random select question mark sitting over in the corner, which just <laughs> annoys anyone who likes symmetry in their uh... design for their character select screens. Mm. I agree with that. Why Why is it ever on the side? Uh. <laughs> As for the comment by Prods about a BB patch at Evo, I honestly think that for the moment Team Blue is probably done with Blaze Blue. What I am suspecting, given that obviously Atlas have been playing Koi and just registering a bunch of domains that are implying Persona 5 spin-off games because publishers do that all the time just to cover base ground, I would not be surprised at all if Team Blue has been hired to make a Persona 5 Arena, and that that's what they've been putting all their resources on since the BBCF port was finished. Did Team Blue make 
uh, who wait who was there a separate persona team no, for persona before? persona team had a different director but most of the animation staff and programming staff was team blue basically basically yeah okay that makes sense um that i i completely agree with that as well actually i also think uh, bb in terms of its patches are done um yeah. I'm, I'm happy with that i like letting the game simmer um but I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's looking like there could be a, a P5U. And, yeah. P, I mean, the cast of Persona 5 would certainly lead to some entertaining characters. I mean, there's a character with a grenade launcher and an axe. <laughs> and there's another character who dresses like a Mad Max character in, in the metaverse and rides a motorbike and does nuclear explosions, so... And practices oh, Aikido, wow. so... That'd be sick. <laughs> I think they could come up with some very Would entertaining you... stuff. As far what about as Morgana, is that the cat rat? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the cat. I mean, he's got a sword and he's got wind magic, so and they could always oh, make okay. him if have. Got a sword, then yeah, you can do it. <laughs> oh, he's Jubei. Oh my goodness. Yeah, Morgana's actually <laughs> Jubei this whole time. <laughs> cat with a sword. Man, I actually think that with the way that. In a, on a more serious note, with the way that Exert plays now, and with the very distinct way that Central Fiction plays, with its God Cancel Overdrives into EAs, completely messing with how pressure worked before, I really feel that the way that P P Persona 4 Arena 2.0 wound up, where it's all about the shadow, shadow characters and the long-range wacky combos from people like Yukiko... I do think by the end of that patching, they had what was very much a distinct third pillar of design. Whereas Blaze Blue is this don't over don't overcommit and low damage game now, with very very situational high damage. Guilty Gear is this wacky old school game, and Persona is this don't watch your feet or you die game. And I like that it's now sufficiently distinct from the other two that it could come back as a third pillar building on like I don't want to see people being able to select regular or shadow versions of characters, I think the way that 2.0 shadow characters are designed should just be how the entire cast plays. Use those just systems. The default. Yeah, throw, throw out the Awakening system. It was dumb and led to really weird game flow. Just ha have it be the... You jostle around... <laughs> sort of like how Nitro Plus Blasters is, where you're jostling around for that first, like... 20% of each other's life then you got those resources and then it's okay if you make a mistake here you die <laughs> and it leads to a very entertaining sort of game which I think would be quite distinct and entertaining yeah Fire Rider that's what I'm saying is I would I like how 2.0 is as a distinct from the other two Arc System Works games so let that be its own wacky third pillar of the Arc System Works machine well, we talked about Persona on the Tekken yeah. show. Persona, it's a, it is its own beast, and I like it. Yeah, yeah. I can respect it doing Cat what it is does. Dumb. It. So, oh wait, we didn't talk about answer. So, my take on answer oh, is kind of yeah, go on about answer. Yeah, yeah, is kind of the opposite of Biken, where I feel Biken was intentionally made a bit too weak. I feel that answer with his counter that is safe. And his, like, his, his counter is safe if you set it off and block it. I should specify, it's all about finding ways to blow him up once you set it off. Or not doing anything than throwing him. Yep, yep. But, besides all that, like, he's got a very wacky counter. He has a bunch of involve frames on any of his wall scroll clean moves. Which allows him to disrespect in ways you wouldn't quite expect. Tossing the business cards reaches absurdly far and allows him to stuff all sorts of approach options from people. <laughs> His buttons are good. He has very wacky multiple instant air dash combos on standing opponents, which then in turn makes... Which means that once you've got to watch out for his good overheads, but also if he tags you with a low then that can also be just as obnoxious to deal with. Mm. And the sorts of setups that people are coming up with... I really are... like that whole thing of the IED combos. Yeah. And a lot saying, of the... Yeah, I really, I really like the addition of the IED. It yeah. gives him a nice feel to answer. Yes. And his dust has the, the red flash completely obscured by the animation itself. And <laughs> so I feel that they intentionally made him a bit too good, particularly the wall cling in, in thing. And I feel that that's... 
the sort of design where since we're trying something new here, then we'll make it intentionally a bit too good, see what facets of the character are being focused on by the players, and then design around that. Okay, which bits are too oppressive from what people are doing? Which bits of the character are they not using enough and would like to see more of? And then tweak him that way. I think he's pretty good. Mm -hmm. We'll probably talk about the tier lists that have been popping up now. And neither of those really talk about Biken or Answer because they felt <laughs> it was too early to give an opinion. But I think mm -hmm. he'll be quite popular as the game rolls on. Yeah, let's take a look at the tier list. Alrighty, so we have two tier lists. Which one do you want to start off with? We have two here recently. Oh, the first one that's popped up in my tabs is the list by Tedesa. For those who don't know, Tedesa is an extremely good jam who's been playing for a million years. Let's set up the window capture. Okay. Bloop. There we are. So, in the S tier, we have Chip and Raven. Which is perfectly understandable. Gamma Blade is active for a million years and trades in his favor all the goddamn time now. Raven <laughs> is a much more fun character to play. And he still gets to do the things that made him obnoxious. He knocks you down and then you have to hold this really obnoxious high-low mix-up. In A tier, we have Kai. Makes sense. Good space control. Good pressure. 6H has less frame advantage, so it's used less for Oki and more as an approach tool now. Venom is interesting. And a uh, pressure reset. Like, Venom's just gotten all these steady little small small buffs and quality of life things that have made him much stronger over time. And I mean, from day one, Carcass Raid pressure is ridiculous hyper fighting. Like, Street Fighter 2 hyper fighting <laughs> levels of pressure. It's horrible to deal with. Elfelt, because the unblockables sometimes cost 25 meter now, but they're still there and they still only cost 25 meter. Sin, we discussed that you feel in some way Sin got buffed. Mm -hmm. Johnny, who they rolled back some of the harshest nerfs on from the Loki tests. And Kum Heyun. Which ones were those? Uh, I think some of the active frame, like the the increased recovery got nerfed, got, got retracted, the, uh, I think. The 5k or the 2s? I can't keep uh. up. <laughs> he... Johnny basically has the same game plan, and the buttons that made him so ridiculous throughout Exert are still ridiculous, so... Johnny's still good. In the B tier, we have Eno, Faust, May, and Slayer. It's... that makes sense. That's characters who are hard to block, characters with space control, and characters with ridiculous damage. The C tier is the basically everyone tier. I mean, Guilty Gear is a game where even if you're in like a C tier, if the momentum goes in your favor, you can still make people die very quickly and make them miserable. The most interesting one is the D tier. So we've got Biken there. Tedesa is a pretty low opinion of Biken. We have Potemkin, because all Potemkin got is an easier combo off of 6k in the corner if you're bad at the game. And most interestingly, Zato <laughs> won. Yeah. This is one of the most contentious things that has been shocker. popping up in a lot of the tier lists, is Zato is considered a bad character now. You got hot takes on that, Alex? I, um... I can't, I can't believe it. Uh, bottom tier? Like, not, not just C tier with the rest of, like, the nerfed soul and whatnot, but bottom tier? That... Oh, that's harsh. Um, I... We'll have to see. Um, so what are some of the reasons you think he's gone down that much, Pitchy? I mean, the biggest reason is obviously that the proximity block hitbox on the drills has been reduced, which means that there's a lot of situations where you would be kind of close to a drill, and you're, like, starting to run up and, like, faultless defense cancel, and you'd be nowhere near the drill, but it would still make you block. And any time that you're spending not moving against Zato, it's time that he's got to either start getting in with jump kicks, or to call in Eddie and then make you block even longer and start running his mix-ups. And so a lot of those little situations in approach, uh, there's less situations where Zato actually gets to start his pressure. And the other thing I feel is simply that Eddie's aren't real, Zato's aren't really dominating a lot of the play at the arcades, which is where a Japanese tier list will pay attention to, or even in tournaments. It's still, mm -hmm. like, Ogawa's always going to be an amazing player, 
because his defense is so good, his decision making is so good, his control of the character is so good. But when the rest of the Zado, when people aren't thinking Zado is an easy wins character, I'm just going to pick him up and do dumb things, or when a lot of the other random tournaments don't have this like one or two Zados nagging at them all the time, then like. The time that you spend learning how to control someone with Zato is time that you could spend learning like Elfelt and getting way more bang for your buck way quicker. So yeah. I can sort of see Enjoy. why they think he's a weak character now. Oh, you there? You just cut yep. out. Hmm. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Well, it all got picked up by the stream chat, but yeah. My connection to you over Discord is not so good while I'm streaming. Hmm. I see, I see. Um, it's so certainly yeah, we'll have to see. Um... Here you go. Oh, no, I was just going to say, yeah, with that in mind, we'll have to... Oh, also, you didn't talk about uh, Kum's placement. Well, I'm going to talk about that as we get to the other tier list. I'll fire <laughs> this one up now. So this is a booklet that came out Ready? after KVO Cross Team Stickbug. There's a lot of very fun stats throughout this, as well as some very cute, as Alex described it, K-Zone magazine-style <laughs> fan art submissions at the end. I'm just scrolling through them quickly. <laughs> very interesting colour choices. But one of the fun <laughs> stat sections is character usage in the 3-on-3 three -three tournament. The most common character was Raven, I believe. Is that Raven or Ramoth? No, no, that's Ramlethal. Ramlethal no, was I the most was popular Ram. 3v3 yeah, yeah. character, so yeah. people, people like facets of her game, clearly still. And Jacko is the least popular, which makes sense since she's gotten, gotten hit pretty hard with nerfs by Rev2. Now, this tier mm. list is sitting here with the Pyramid Scheme. Biken and Answer are both sitting in the bottom as a basically a DQ. They're not being counted as. We have a much broader set of tiers, where this is basically... The super strong, the very strong, and the not so good. So the S tier is expanded to not only have Chip and Raven. I'm not quite sure who compiled this tier list. It feels like one that whoever made the booklet would have compiled by talking to lots of people and probably putting in averages or something. But mm -hmm. we have Bedman, we have Johnny, we have Sin. Johnny and Sin make sense. Bedman is, I guess, even without having all the gimmicks from the teleporting cross-up 6H and losing some of his launch combos, just when Batman knocks you down, it is some Marvel versus Capcom nonsense. Oh, you have no idea what's happening. Just Yeah, <laughs> you say he lost the gimmick of cross-up 6H, but boy, did he gain a lot of gimmicks. If you watch um, those matches at KSV, oh, oh yeah, good heavens. Like You look at Saber Missile, and that is a bad bloke. That, that Batman is not a cool guy to fight. <laughs> But we again see in the S tier, Kum Hei Yun. Oh boy. This character used to be considered rubbish, slow, mix-ups yeah. are easier to block than you would expect, the unblockables aren't really worth it. I think the biggest, the most notable change, just from memory, is that Kum's crouching kick now immediately combos into 2H. And it works as a block string as well. This means that in addition to using 2k as a move that has frame advantage. You've also got automated frame traps in a 2h. You also get to reset pressure if they're faultless defensing by being able to jump cancel your 2h, which is way better than things like fast slash for establishing pressure. And, excuse me, 2k in a 2h means that off of lows, Kum Hyun gets the red kick loop and all the big fat damage. So... That feels like something, and maybe just the Japanese players have really started to work out some really grimy setups with Kun, where you get them scared of... Because all you need to do now is make them scared of the overhead. A bit like when we were talking about Steven and the Rock, and how when you've got the looming threat of the Rock, is when you can then stop using the Rock and just go low or throw them, and they get blown up by it. So maybe we've hit this point where if you can get people scared of Kun Heon's overhead... Like, you knock him down, throw the ball, whiff the first hit of 5H, second hit of 5H hits, ball pushes them in so you get a combo off it. That stuff all leads to the big fat damage. So then they get scared to block low by default. And just 2k 2H means you get red kick loop, and that's big fat pile of damage. 
and a big fat pile of meter so then he can yeah, set up things shows, like the unblockable yeah it just shows what happens it just shows what happens when you um when you increase the reward of one option so much it's such a, a fundamental button 2k yeah it's so fundamental to uh kum yeah um, like it's when, short yeah, but when you increase the reward off that majorly um it just yeah it really gets you spooked and changes the whole risk reward of his different options and how you defend against him yes like i feel that that's probably the biggest thing that has changed the opinion of him and it's possible that there's japanese players in the arcades that have got a lot more wacky setups and are landing them more consistently now and have found those ways to actually get in with kum to really get it going so that feels like um, those two were things there any other were there any other changes to kum aside from the 2k2h yes but i can't remember them <laughs> i need to go dig up yeah yeah the i just wonder if his neutral got changed at all or anything i think the neutral is mostly the same i mean the balls are still okay. fairly good moves the rush kicks a fairly good move but if you can but i mean like just having more red kicks means that when he does get in the rewards better and the meter gains so much better which means he then has a lot more tools to play with in the A tier here, yeah. we have basically everyone. everyone. <laughs> it's the, hey, everyone's top tier in Guilty Gear. This is a booklet promoting this game that we like. So everyone's everyone's <laughs> viable. All matchups are 5v5. Five five, uh, five five. We can make jokes like that, but I mean, Guilty Gear is such a momentum heavy game that when pretty much anyone gets on top of you, cat, if you make like three bad calls in a row, then you just die. And the round's over in 15 seconds. Yeah. And Jacko, this, like, <laughs> Jacko f seems reasonable to put as your obligatory bad character now. I can see arguments for Potemkin being better than Jacko now. And, but again, we have seen okay. Zato is still sitting down here in the B rank. In the bottom tier of this yeah. tier list. So it definitely feels like the, the bottom, Kum, yeah. the Kum and the Zato other things where there's the big difference in the Japanese and the Western metas at the moment. So seeing how much of this understanding comes into play as we get to CEO and Evo will be very interesting to watch out for. Um, when is CEO? CEO is pretty soon, I think. That's... Let's switch mm, okay, okay. Are there any other big tournaments before CEO? Because we've Probably. just had Combo Breaker. I mean, um, yes, we did just have Combo Breaker, though, man. That's a big tournament for pretty much every game. Yeah. I can't I can't remember the American tournament <laughs> and, um, schedule at the moment. Summer Jam's yeah. coming up soon, I think. I mean, that's a Big E event, so... Nah, that's not as big, yeah. yeah it's kind of sad that Big um, E events aren't considered quite as high caliber as they were in the past. Because, I mean, people who go to them is, usually have a good time. Does Biggie, does Biggie do final round? No, that's Shin Blanca. Ah, oh, okay, yep. Biggie is things like Winter Brawl, Summer Jam, mm -hmm. Northeast mate, Northeast Championships and stuff. That's the one I was thinking of, yes. Yeah, so I was like, there's like, a really big one, yeah. Like all, all the really wacky East Coast... All the events that still feel yeah. extremely <laughs> East Coast American... <laughs> Yeah, that anime is always surprisingly big at all of the uh, biggie ones. Oh, yeah, all the Philly boys show up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's about it for... Um, I'm trying to remember... I was just going to say, I'm trying to remember who won Combo Breaker. Was it Dogra or did he come second? No, it was Dogra, yeah. Yeah, it was Dogra. With Raven. Sadly, yeah. I missed a lot of Combo Breaker. I was busy at the time. So there's a big pile of archives that I could watch. Like, I haven't even seen what the games were for Mystery Tournament. <laughs> good old mystery tournament yeah because it's the um successor to ufgt isn't that combo breaker yes mm, yes all righty well i think we're we've covered guilty gear so i Hopefully. had the end of my guilty gear notes had this segue to tekken but we already talked about what was going to be the segue which is online play on pc is currently <laughs> having issues this is hurting player base a lot speaking of things that are hurting the player base a lot tekken 7 came out <laughs> and it was i think it was friday saturday some sometime in the last few days i fired up my friends list and where it would previously have a big pile of guilty gear excerpt revelator 
or maybe other random games people are playing by themselves, suddenly I had about 20 people all in Tekken 7. So, it's blowing up pretty big. It's a, it's a big launch. It is a huge launch. It's the launch. biggest fighting game launch on Steam. It has yes. bigger player base than Street Fighter V mm -hmm. already. If you look at the peak numbers on it. Um, so I guess the and first... And it's great. <laughs> it's cool. I'm always happy to see people excited about a fighting game. And it'll be interesting to see how yeah. many persist with the game. I guess the first thing I'll mention is... Tekken 7, from what I've seen, doesn't have particularly good education of how to play Tekken, in particular how things like movement work, and, like, there's learning how to hit buttons in Tekken. Do you mean but... within the game? Yeah, within the game itself. Mm, yeah. And, like, lear knowing uh, how to I move can, in Tekken completely it. changes you from being this slow tank who whiffs punish with buttons, to <laughs> being this thing that slides around the battlefield. Sort of like you're playing Soul Calibur, like Soul Calibur movement, but with like 20 times the APM. It feels like um, when you see Street Fighter players go to anime and try anime, and they're just not, they're walking back and forth, and you're like, what are you doing? You can do so much more. You could be moving around so much better than you are. Oh, the A1 Kai. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. <laughs> Well, he's still doing that, yeah. He's still just a tank on the ground. Well, I mean, that's the beauty of A1's Kai, is yeah. that Guilty Gear is the anime game where you can get away with not moving if you don't feel like it. <laughs> We've talked about him plenty of times on the show so far. I was going to say, yeah, I think that's a, <laughs> every show you've mentioned A1's Kai. <laughs> that's one of our hot topics. I'll need to make a soundbite for it. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, movement is so important. No, there's I... no tutorial. There are no challenges for individual characters. Um, huh. But so you really have to go online. Um, it's a good age, <laughs> information age and all uh, for that. But yeah, it is kind of sad that there's nothing in the game yes. to teach you. What sources are you using to learn stuff, particularly when it comes to things like movement? Um, a lot of YouTube stuff. YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Um, avoiding the puddle, Aris. I've been uh, watching yes. a lot of his stuff. Um, his Tekken Tag 2 tutorials as well. They have a lot of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Uh, frame data I've been looking up on RB Norway, I think it's called. Um, yeah, I think it'll pop up on Tekken Zaibatsu at some point as well. Yeah, I think, I think mainly those two. Uh, yeah, the Avoiding the Puddle YouTube channel. That's yep. been a lot of it. Yeah, Aris oh, and, is putting... Oh, just random combos. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, random combos you can look up on YouTube and game matches. Yeah. My Tekken knowledge, I pushed buttons in most Tekken games and never really got the hang of any of the flow and I'm not the biggest 3D fan anyway. Basically, all the stuff I know about Tekken is from random times where I've just mugged Yusuf and gone, hey, there's some Tekken <laughs> thing going on. What's the cheap buttons that I can do with no effort? And he went, okay. You pick Leo, and you do down back one plus two, and you do down back four, and then one. And that's what I do. I don't need to move. I have these buttons that move for me. Yeah, I, uh, another resource that's available is the Tekken Zaibatsu Discord, but mm. it's a lot worse, I think, than the, um, say, the Guilty Gear and the Blaze Blue individual character discords because it's one centralized Tekken Discord oh, and boy. it has channels for each of the characters. That's going to exactly. lead to a lot of yeah. white noise. So there's a lot less detail. It's very messy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's not particularly good right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the game just uh, and launched. And asking questions on Twitter. That's the other... Form yes. Signs me. of the modern age. Is there anything... I mean, obviously we've talked mm. about how we've gotten the insights on how you, when learning to move, you kind of feel like a Street Fighter guy playing anime. Is there any anything else from anime <laughs> games that has helped you learn Tekken at this point? From anime games specifically, um, not that I can think of, but it's rather just being experienced with fighting games, yep. um, and having a certain learning process, uh, now that I'm a lot more experienced with games than say, I don't know, three years ago. Oh yeah. Well, Your I attitude is... I would have done, but now I really take the bite-sized chunks. Hmm. Your attitude in general is so different from even about 18 months ago, honestly. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I really... Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think I've improved a lot as a player since then. Um, but for example, some of the things I do in Tekken 7, or just when I'm learning any game, but I really have to apply it in Tekken 7, is the good old record feature in training mode. Oh, yes. I use it so much in anime games. Yep. It is your best friend. It's a bit obnoxious to use in the T7 one, hmm. but um, a great example is Oli, uh, Oren was bullying me with Claudio the other day. I couldn't punish his damn uh, while running too. Uh, so I, <laughs> I had to go into training mode, record it, mix up between doing while running two and dash up hop kick. There's yep. uh, one you can crouch under, the while running two, and the hop kicks in mid, so it blows you up for crouching. Yes. So I was trying to see, okay, if I, can I sidestep at this range? Does that cover both things? Um, just things like that. So those are, uh, yeah, situations, practicing situations. Yep. I, I freaking preach about this all the time. Use the recording uh, and playback feature. See what your answers are for situations. That's the main thing. Yeah. Um, That's always a good thing to look out for when you're learning any game is... If you're feeling like you're getting swamped with too much information, then play a few more games. Just see what is one thing that one. Just look for one thing that's driving you nuts over the course of a few games, and then you go back and you re you either talk to the <laughs> yeah. person you're playing with or you record that situation in the in training mode, and you see okay, what can I do about this one thing, and you get that, and even then, once you do all the thinking and the processing, as always. When you're actually in a game, the aim is to not actually be thinking. The aim is to have done all the thought thinking beforehand and trained it into your hands. So as soon as you see that situation pop up, you're barely thinking about it. You're just moving your hands and doing the response that you worked out earlier. Hmm. Breaking things down into um, one problem at a time. Another... Yes, and uh, another thing on that topic about uh, information overload, I suppose, uh, is obviously oh, yeah. the move lists in Tekken have over a hundred moves or something. Yes, but um, a great resource I read before the launch of Tekken Seven, about a week uh, uh, before the launch, it came out, was um, someone had made a guide on the top fifteen moves for yes. each of the characters and what you should focus on with them. Yes, and, uh, I, I was reading that so much. I uh, went through it all, like studied it. Um, at my break at work, I'd be reading through it, be thinking of it uh, while I'm working. I'd be thinking of those moves. Okay, I've seen them in matches. What do they do? What is Brian's stuff? What's Kazumi's stuff? And um, trying to remember the frame data of that in my head. Yeah. Yes, that is that like that page. I'll probably link that one in the chat if I can quickly remember where yeah, it is. Yeah, please do link it in the, like uh, when you upload it to YouTube. Put it in the description yes, as well. Like, That's that was so helpful. That for me. video <laughs> is inc that like th that web page is an incredibly good resource and like that's essentially how even top level Tekken is played is it is very much a game where there's just yeah a lot of the moves are somewhat superfluous they all have uses and a lot of them are things that based on your position you'll somewhat intuitively intuitively hit because it's just eh here's a bunch of extra things you can mm -hmm. tack on at the end of a string or just here's a directional normal like a down forward three or something which is basically this kick that you use at this range and as you're playing the game and just kind of hitting buttons, you'll get in the habit of those sorts of ideas. But yeah, like, what is a move that's plus? What is a move that moves you forward? What is a quick move to check people? What is a slightly less quick move that will hook you up with some damage when someone's done something dumb on you? Those are pretty much the most important things to look out for. And then from there, like, do I have some moves that have, that just avoid a bunch of stuff? <laughs> and... yeah having a good idea of your punish normals is very helpful i've found yeah. um so obviously i know frame data from playing other fighting games now that's another change uh that i wouldn't have been able to really understand three years ago um just knowing things like okay what's my 10 frame what's my 13 frame and what is my 15 frame big damage punisher yep uh just having that in your mind is so helpful mm -hmm. and but um, there's still a lot of other... Oh boy, sidestepping? Like, that is so foreign to me. Just the whole game is so completely and utterly foreign to me. Yep. Every every slow-mo, every time a slow-mo happens, I have no idea what's going to happen. There's Look, kind man. of a, a, a childlike <laughs> uh, fun, and uh, I'm very bewildered a lot of the time. A like, journey of discovery. And a lot of these um, kind of roundhouse-looking normals, I suppose, a standing yes. four or a forward four. 
I'd be like, is that a high? Should I crouch under it? Oh no, that's a mid. What? That looks like a high or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's a habit you need to learn with any 3D game is you block high by default and you block low on reaction as opposed to 2D games where you block low mm-hmm. by default and you block high on reaction. And things like low profiling are way more prevalent for dealing with moves in 3D games than they are in 2D, where mm. it's like, okay, here's a big driver. Do I have a move to low profile that? Or it's like, there's a lot more big drivers. You got to work out how to low profile. <laughs> Tekken Seven. There's a lot of big drivers. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm basically playing the equivalent of Soul, where you know Soul's solution is: does this move look at all like it's above the ground? I'm just gonna push 2D, and I'm gonna go under it. And with Leo, <laughs> you push down one plus two, and the same thing happens. <laughs> and it's just sweet. Just like um, uh, Shao use AOP. Oh, yeah, Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> the same with Leo, where it's just you do be okay, and you go under everything, and then you do a launcher that's minus nine. <sighs> so for reference, <laughs> ten frame moves is like your jab punish. Ten frame is your fa- is gonna be mm. your fastest move, and that'll be like pushing punch twice at Guilty Gear and they're not getting on other follow-up. But there's some characters who do, like, you're playing Kazumi. And from memory, mm. Kazumi's 10-frame move can be hit confirmed into 1-1-2, which gets her a knockdown. Not yes. much damage, but she does get oh, to I love it. swing the momentum in her favor that way. That is my, like, fa- <laughs> that's one of my favorite things with her. 1-1-2, one, 1-1-2. One, two, one, one, two. Any yep. of the- I think all the Mishimas have it, uh, if I can recall correctly. Yeah. Um, and then being able to hit, con- so the 1-1-2, one, one, two, the 2-ender two is, like, really unsafe on block. But you can hit confirm it. Which yes. You-, you can't always do with Tekken strings up notice. Yes, um, that's so right. having that as an option, whenever I'm breaking, oh, mash out 1-1 one, one, and hit confirm it and get the knockdown. Oh, it's juicy. <laughs> yeah, it's like how I have that big Aikido two fists, sort of like a Hihachi move with leo and that one's hit confirmable as a string mm. that is a handy string i mean like you saw when yes. we were playing on sunday that i only used like five or six moves with leo the entire time we played pretty much yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I did the sweep thing <laughs> i did the 10 i did the 10 frame check i did the back two into the high hachi move i did the low stance launch thing and i did that one really good hop kick though like up three plus four, which isn't a hop kick, but it goes over a bunch of stuff and is a useful Oki move. Oh, and I use the wacky standing low, the down two plus three, which knocks down now. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, that, yeah. that was annoying. That so moves. I guess there was about seven moves that I used and like, that's all I was doing and I was doing stuff. My, I had no combos. Yeah, yeah. But I could drive no. the guys who were there nuts. Yeah. <laughs> You're beating up some folks, yeah. Yeah, shout outs to that guy. Should have taught him to check out the channel. Oh well, we'll just grab him next time I'm at Oh what ESG. new guy, Alex? Yes. Other Alex. Nega Alex. Fake Alex. Yeah, we got we got three Alex. It's madness. <laughs> no more Adams, yeah. <laughs> Only one. Yes. Um yeah, uh, I I can't overstate enough how much of a gargantuan task it seems to be learning Tekken 7. <laughs> Went to sidestep, blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's just so much. And so much of it is um, specific character knowledge, uh, specifically in defense. Um, I, <laughs> for a yeah, good example, yeah, uh, when I played that Alex guy um, yep. at ESG on Sunday, and he played uh, Feng. I've never played against before. Yes. I just, you can't block anything when you don't know a character. You don't know nope. what is happening. It's, it's so hard. <laughs> Especially really in a so game hard. where the lows are something you're supposed to re- respond to, but often they're just so fast and the damage isn't high, but that's, that's what leads to the low health comebacks being so tense in pretty much every 3D game is there is always the chance that you'll just slightly not watch your feet and some very, very quick low damage shin kick will be just <laughs> enough damage to kill you. Yeah, yeah. So you got to play out of your That's mind. That's when you get those all those hype low parries yeah. on low health. <laughs> but even then, when it comes to dealing with a lot of stuff, it's why you see a lot of the best, a lot of the high-level Tekken players. And you watch every time that there is a JDCR versus Saint grand final which is pretty much every international tournament or sometimes knee or someone will pop up but 
you look at the way that they play and they focus so much on making sure their movement is crisp because they know that it's so hard to block stuff. Even at the top level, it's so hard to block things in Tekken. So focus yeah. on just not being near your opponent at all. Only go in on your terms either as a whiff punish, or if you have the right spacing that you reckon your approach will work in. Run a mix-up. Did it work? Great. Run some Oki and tack on like 70% of your damage. Did it not work? Get the hell out of there. Try to block one thing <laughs> and then just get out. Korean backdash your way out. Sidestep if you have to. Do something to not be near them until it's on your terms again. Yeah, yeah. It's very turn-based um, because pretty much everything is minus. Yes. 95% <laughs> of your moves are minus on block. Yes. Um, but what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, I'm really having a lot of fun with trying to improve my movement and with punishing. Yeah. Uh, with punishing and, like, reads. Those are, obviously, they're transferable from other fighting games, um, but <laughs> it's a very fun aspect. Yeah. Mm. I know you're going to freaking mash that rage out, you scrub, online and ranked. Like, <laughs> well, with punishing. Things like that, yeah. There's a lot of yeah. small victories. With punishing is an interesting one to talk about. Because, as we probably know, Tekken 7 has a larger amount of native input delay than Street Fighter V. And this is an important yes. thing to mention because, unlike Street Fighter V, Tekken 7 is very much a game designed to work with a large amount of native input delay because you can still whiff punish in this game as lots of things have really bad recovery on whiff and big telegraphed animations when they do, so you know that you have enough time to see and respond when someone is whiffed, and then still have time to input and that will actually punish something. Rather than being a game and where there's way too many... Silly... You don't have these silly Balrog rush punches that are like five frames or whatever it is that you just can't react to. Yes. <laughs> In neutral. And so, as always, native input delay is less important than designing the game to work with input delay. To use my favourite anime example, when Guilty Gear Plus R was released, it was understood that the cabinets were going... the Ring Edge 2 cabinets had way more native input delay than Accent Core, which was still designed with CRT monitors in mind with no delay. There was like two, two frames of input delay in most Guilty Gear versions, just through the hardware interpretation, but... So with Plus R, they knew that there were going to be about four more frames of delay. And for the most part, it was okay, because it was a pretty low input delay anyway, and most things still worked, but they reworked the overheads, so the overheads that were intended to be really hard to react to, like Tiger Need Bad Moon, Milia 6K, Zato 6K, those sorts of things, those all had, like, if anything, a one frame adjustment to make them, like, one frame slower, if that. The buttons that were intended to be slower and reactable in the first place, where the key to using them is less about reactions than it is conditioning your opponents, establishing rhythms in pressure, or just tagging people when you're at an approach range where people are starting to block low, anticipating a sweep, and then they get caught with the dust, you know, like May players often do, the almighty unblockable footsie dust. <laughs> like, those sorts of things, they all had an increase in startup to match the input delay of the monitors. And no one ever talks about this input delay okay. in Plus R because the game is designed so you never notice that it's a thing that happened. Yeah, the input delay is so infuriating in SF5. <laughs> like, I remember when the beta came out and um, coming from playing a bit of SF4, but just trying to... Oh. So <laughs> even if it's increased by a small amount, when these certain things have these binary kind of responses, for yes. example an anti-air with a DP. If it, oh, there's a big difference if you manage to anti-air them in time or if it gets blocked when they jump in. And oh, I can yeah. tell you a lot of times in SF5 when I started playing it, I was very frustrated as Ken because I'm like, that would definitely have hit in uh, SF4. I would that, have DP'd the yeah. heck out of you at that jump. That's always felt how I always felt when playing Dalsim in 5, where I see people moving and I hit like mm. low strong and I'm seeing this button just beyond the hitbox design issues Street Fighter V has. There's points where I'm seeing this hand go clearly through them and have just moved past because the game hasn't responded <laughs> the way I had. Yeah. I mean, 
Do we want to talk? Yes, yes. Do we want to do some SF5 bashing for a bit? Because <laughs> Corey Gaming released a video about Street Fighter Five, and I do not like Street Fighter mm. Five, but I like that video less than I like Street Fighter Five. Are you? Yeah, I heard you complain about that video a lot. Yeah, I. I have a problem with in the, videos... In the, in, in the way it talks about Street Fighter Five. Yeah, I feel it's a game... It's a video that somewhat dumbs down and oversimplifies the discourse around the problems people mm. have with Street Fighter Five because it is a deeply, and is deeply that flawed game. And to that, uh, that chart? Yes. But if we don't talk about the issues in a sensible way that will actually result... We won't be able to learn and repeat its mistakes. Oh, prevent repeating its mistakes. I mean, like, my favourite quote that I'll dig up is because I found it so surreal. Let's fire up the image that I took of it. And I might actually do, like, a retort video, a rebuttal video, because I would like to see people talking about Street Fighter V in a smarter way. My favourite quote is... Alright, it's floating around here. We'll turn off the stream chat quickly. You might be thinking, if Street of Five is so random, then why do we still see players who still do well consistently? It's for the same reason that we see consistency in professional poker. Players like Daniel Negrino has won six World Series of Poker bracelets and over three thirty million dollars in prize money, despite playing a game that's literally gambling. Richard Garfield points out that luck and skill are not mutually exclusive, which means games can require high luck and high skill, low luck and high skill, high luck and low skill, and low luck and low skill. So he doesn't actually explain any of the reasons that players are really winning consistently in Street Fighter V. He just wants to move into a rhetoric of yes. likening Street Fighter V to being nothing but gambles. And I can get where this comes from, because the central component of gambling in Street Fighter V comes from the pure Oki. Oki in this game is built around... You knock someone down, and regardless of whether they're delay teching, quick rising, or just doing the native time, the mix-up is always going to be either you've walked up, so you're right next to them, and they cannot act because they're knocked down, and as they're getting up, you either do a meaty normal, or you throw them. And if you've timed it right, this is unreactable, and there's nothing yep. you can do about it. Whereas in Street Fighter 4... You had the crouching light kick option select, where if you mash throw while crouching, there wasn't a throw with animation when you're crouching, so instead give crouching light kick. And in Street Fighter 3, the option was that you had a, an option select with throw tech and parry. So in Street Fighter 4, you needed to carry throw or do like a jumping move, which is why safe jumps were way more popular, along with DPs being so good in Street Fighter 4. Or you would do moves that have some airborne and, property. And uh, backdash as well. Yeah, and backdashes were in Vol as well, which would also blow this up. In Street Fighter 3, you had op crouched. You had an option select with low parry, which would lose two things like universal overhead. In Street Fighter 2, you just mash the crap out of throw back because they're instant, and you're probably going to have to be put in a throw break situation anyway, <laughs> which is why it's a lot more like Guilty Gear, where the way that you blow it up is by looking like you're in throw range, but you're actually not, and then hitting a button. Mm -hmm. And then they try to mash throw, it's with a slower button than yours, and they get hit. In the alpha games, uh, who cares, you're doing like a custom combo unblockable, or v nonsense. Ah, <laughs> uh, the alpha games are awesome, but yeah. In Street... F and this is where... So, this is very much... Basically, in Street Fighter V, every character is forcing you to deal with Grappler Oki. And if I can just interrupt for a second, yep. um, we can't forget that SF5 did have Fuzzy Jump until recently. It had the Jump Back Throw option select, but that yes. was uh, recently removed in the latest patch. Yes. The Ed patch, I think. Now, one of the things that helps a lot of a number of top players be consistent is you have to play this guessing game less if you're playing the higher damage characters. Like, since so many characters are playing the Grappler Rocky game, the characters who got the highest damage reward off it are better characters. Like, this is part of why Meek is so good, and to a certain extent, Laura in Season 2, is because they're playing the same game as everyone else. It's just that the giant swing and the... What's a Ford grab? The Death Valley driver or something? Sorry, I'm being 
oddly specific about getting the wrestling terms right <laughs> is anyway the point is that Mika is getting way more damage from this gamble situation than some of the other characters are and so that's the problem rather than well you know there's gambling I mean people and the other reason the other thing that and um Oh boy, Varrog. Oh, but, but before I talk about, about Boxer. Off things. Before I talk about even Boxer. <laughs> so, that's a bit of ex- further explaining the problem of the gamble. The gamble Oki situation in Street Fighter V. But the thing is, even if stuff is reactable in fighting games, like I mentioned a bit before with Dusts, a very important part of why there's such consistent wins is because people can is conditioning. The almighty David Serlin Yomi. And yeah, I get to put over David Serlin on this radio show, so <laughs> this is quite a special episode. Where, like... So, a Slayer can hit you with crouching kick, crouching kick, crouching kick, crouching kick, mapper and the like. And then he might do an overhead, and the overhead's reactable. But, if the rhythm is broken up, so... Normally he does crouching kick, mapper, crouching kick, mapper, crouching kick, mapper. If he does crouching kick, then dust... If you haven't seen a dust in a while, then your brain sometimes goes, Hey, what's that move? That's right. That's an overhead. It's starting up soon. I should block high. And by the time, since your brain's been so used to watching this pattern of kick mupper, kick mupper, kick mupper, your brain's having this little pause. I talked in the last show about how pauses, much like when you're driving, is what leads to deaths. So that time that you process things means that you get hit. And this is what happens in high-level Street Fighter V, is you establish these patterns of, I'm doing meaty light kick every time on Oki. And then I mix it up, and then I throw you. And the top players are really good at doing this sort of thing to people, but also, they're very used to making sure that their brain doesn't get confused and caught up in this situation. And they go, okay, I can still make a good guess, and I'm going to be confident that it's the right decision and get out of that situation in the first place. And that allows to... And uh, it, it really is such an important skill in uh, fighting games, being able to really stop the autopilot. Yes. Because um, I remember how I used to be was, uh, how I used to play was, I'm like, okay, well this string is like the best string for that option, and this is the best yep. string for that option. But I always do it at the same timing. It, uh, yeah. There's so much you can do by mixing it up. It really the days of your Ragnar always doing the always inputting the <laughs> jump on option select on the C, because in Blaze Blue there's stuff that's jump cancelable and hit but not block, and so like you had these really autopiloted burst baits and then they stopped working because you're always gonna keep doing this. Yeah, five B five C jump cancel. Uh, excuse me, I need to go to the toilet. If you would like to quickly talk about something <laughs> while I relieve myself. No see, worries, no worries. I'll what's try a talk question? about tech in a bit more. Yeah, what's a question that I can throw Sorry? at you? Actually, yeah. a proposal that I'm going to put forward, and you can suss this out by yourself while I quickly relieve myself. Do you think that Tekken mm-hmm. should have button dashes, like Marvel or Melty Blood? I think that's something that would really... Be- I legit think this is something that would benefit the game a lot at this point. Oh, that's tough. Okay, you go to the toilet while I think about that. Um, um, that's, that's really, really tough, tough to say. say. Um, and I suppose the implication is, with if you use a button dash, uh, if you can still... The question is, does it still have that cancelability that the current Tekken dashes do into sidestep or crouch, whatever you want? Um, and the other question is, can you block during it? Um, because currently, because you've got... Um, you're doing back back for the dash. Um, one of the things with the back dash in Tekken is, unlike I think every other back dash that I know of, at least, uh, you can block during it. So that's why lows, long reaching lows and quick low pokes have this additional uh, usage and utility to them uh, in that they will catch people back dashing, which is normally such a safe option. Because if you're sticking out things, if you think, oh, they're back dashing, let me stick out a long poke. If it's not low, they're going to be able to block during that back dash. Um, which is I only found about the other day, but that's that just seems crazy. Uh, the fact that you can block during the backdash. Um, so the question would have to be, 
does it retain all the current properties uh, of the manual lever input uh, dashing in Tekken if there was to be replaced with a button dashing? Um, I suppose, yeah, the reason Pitchy's brought it up is because da dashing is such a key part of Tekken uh, in the same way it is for Marvel. Um, so that's why you see it get replaced with the uh, the button, two button dashing in Marvel 3 because it's so crucial to it and it would be it'd be such a pain to have to like dash around with the double tapping uh, a direction in Marvel 3 every time um, and it but it is for Tekken, it is such a it's such a key point as we've uh, reiterated throughout the show um, would it be good to have button presses? Ooh. Let me think about that. Two buttons to dash, or or a separate dashing button. I, I'm gonna. I think yes, actually. I think yes, because it really it just catches people up to that skill gap faster. Um, and it's, you could say it's dumbing it. It, it definitely is dumbing it down to an extent. But the the intention behind the dashing and the the mind games uh, centered around that dashing and the movement options are still there. The only difference is you're taking out the physical execution requirements. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think that would be a good idea. It really catches people up to the skill gap faster. Oh, you're back. Oh, are you back, Pitchy? Um, but yeah, I think that, that covers it nicely, yeah. I, I agree with button dashing. You there, Pitchy? <laughs> we will have to grab his thoughts. And what are your thoughts in the chat, uh, Nurk and Steven and Fire Rider and all the other fellows in the chat? Um, do you think it should have the double button press? as a macro for dash or any other kind of dash macro, easy macro to replace the uh, double tapping. Hmm. Yeah, Steven says, making something easier just takes out the executional barrier, not how you use it. If it's well designed, it doesn't matter how easy it is. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that, I completely agree with that. That's pretty much what I was saying about the mind games are all still there. The, uh, the mental intention of how you use the dash is still still retained. Um, Fear not. It's just I have returned everyone. Barrier. Alrighty. So you were talking something about execution. That ties into a comment that has yep. been in the chat. Which is now I don't want to really get into skill floor and skill ceiling discussions. I'll leave that for another time because that is a very interesting can of worms that we can flesh out when we've got another fresh two hours and fresh voice. But a comment that was made earlier by Steven in the chat is that one of the issues with the Core A Gaming video is that it is essentially says that it implies that the only form of skill is raw technical execution. It talks about how the only example of expression of a personality is by talking about Sakonoko and his wacky combos that he does in games. It's funny that his evil Ryu axe kick loop is considered the fu funky execution combo rather than like the Sakura Tatsu loops, his old Ibuki setups, or even the way he played things like Vampire Savior, where he played Boletta in a way more execution heavy, wacky combo way than a lot of other people did. But the important, there's, as we discussed before, things like how you condition people and how you respond to being conditioned is a valuable form of skill. There's obviously wacky situational awareness, which isn't necessarily about what combos you can start, like it often is in, say, Guilty Gear, but also just what sorts of moves can you tack on someone based on the position you're in. If there's some wacky, unconventional solution to a setup, that sort of thing can be forms of expression, but I'll give you a personal anecdote about how limited Street Fighter V's expression was for me when I first fired up the game. Because when I first fired it up, I actually wanted to play Laura. Are you okay. there? Yes. Good, we're all working. Yep. There was a bunch of white noise coming through. So, I wanted to play right. Laura because she had a command grab, she had a rush move, 
some buttons that kind of reminded me of Bullet, and she had a V-Skill. Now, Laura's V-Skill is you tap left or right, and you'll do a command step either forwards or backwards. If you tap neutral, you do this big wheel kick. And if you hold the V skill while doing the command dashes, after she does them, she'll do the wheel kick. And when I... And you can... It's classed as a special move as far as cancelling goes, so... Crouching medium kick can be done into this V skill. And what I thought I would do... Is do crouching medium kick into quarter forward light punch. And I'll use that as my default go-to block string, yep. where... Make them block this and establish, I'm someone who's just trying to batter you with this sort of pressure thing. And then what I would do is I would move into then doing crouching medium kick into the command step, into command throw. To go, aha, you thought that I was doing the, you thought I was doing this pressure thing, but instead I started to throw you. And then what I thought I would do yep. is when they're starting to get to this level, I would then do command step into the leapy kick and go aha now i'm catching you from jumping Ooh. out and i'll start then working in more of a game about crouching medium kick into say step back leap kick and the like so then people are getting scared by this sort of space mm -hmm. control and like mid-range pressure and then that's when i'd start whipping out things like forward fierce and the anti-air grab and the like so i have like this multi-tiered thing of this but then i tried to do it in a game and i discovered that the wheel kick thing is like minus 30. Because in Street Fighter V, <laughs> you're allowed a light button that is plus, a medium button that is plus, and nothing else has is plus or even safe. Everything else that is a remotely interesting tool is like minus a billion mm. and gets punished immediately. All so, the wacky stuff, yeah. So all of my entire thing of what I thought, looking at her tool set, this is how this character would play, and this is some sort of diverse way I can play essentially the way I play Bullet in Street Fighter, and none of it was even an option. And I went, well, this is great, I'll just do some wacky dalsim knockdowns into cross-ups. <laughs> and then I discovered that I couldn't even yeah, zone like, with dalsim's the, buttons uh, effectively. Was really slow. What if the overhead was really slow, so the idea is you interrupt it, and then it's, I don't know, safe on block, or plus, yeah. Yeah, or I thought like that, like that would be the point of the back step, is you get people used to seeing this overhead and trying to interrupt it, but then their button whiffs because I've done the back step first. <laughs> so, like, like I said, there are many issues I have with Street Fighter Five, but that video did not do a very good job of highlighting the problems that I have with the game. Mm. And, um. So do you want to wrap it up with uh, your answer to the button or lever movement for the dashing and Tekken? Well, I have no idea what the arguments you put forward were is, but I think it's something... Oh, sorry. Uh, so pretty much it depends on whether it uh, maintains the properties of the current back dashing and whatnot, in that you can still cancel into side steps and whatnot, um, and can you still block during it? So you can currently, you can block mids, and yeah, yes. when you're backdashing currently, but you yeah, can't block right. blows, obviously. So it would depend if the button dash has that. Um, and then I said, I think it's good because it closes the skill gap and you're still not, um, you, all the mind games and the intention behind the dashing is still there. You're just making it physically easier, so it's more accessible. Yeah, that's basically how I feel. I feel that, and obviously this is something that might come up different if we asked an actual Tekken player, but I feel that's one of the realms where that That is a component of the game where pure execution is getting in the way of the more interesting two-player interactions. And I would like to have seen Harada experiment with it at some point. Uh, I guess we can wrap things up there for tonight. There was some joke that I was yeah. going to bring up. All right, so Fire Rider, <laughs> our voice from last time, has declared that Persona DPs are a beautiful mistake. To which I say, there is no mistake with Persona uh, DPs. <laughs> that game is stupid, and uh, the DPs in that game... Oh, like, I guess the context of complaining about Persona DPs is complaining about having one button reversals. But Persona is such a ferocious so pressure game. And there's so many movement options that allow DPs to whiff or be air blocked that I really don't have a problem with how the DPs are in that game. And I kind of feel, like I was saying before, that I like 
Persona 2.0 being that real, you made one bad call once you got loaded up with resources and you just die. And having the wacky DPs provided an extra, they, they add to that extremity where it's either this DP landed and boom, I'm in there. Now it's my chance to make them die. <laughs> or <laughs> they got that hard read on me. And now I am dead forever. I'm dead so hard that I should probably lose two oh rounds at once. Boy. Oh boy, if you get a DP blocked in Persona, oh, the fatal counter combos in that game are absolutely brutal. You're losing 8k or something it's, if they've got any meter. <laughs> it's you are, If it's the right character, you are literally going to get hit by an instant kill spell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, that game... Yeah, bringing the memories back. Oh, that's so fun. <laughs> oh, man. So wacky. Sometimes I'm tempted to actually learn another character in Persona. But it's like, all I want to play is 2.0 Yukiko, because I really like combos that just push them out to full screen and then keep going. <laughs> Especially it's since after like, uh, she gets... Elizabeth and Margaret. Yep. Especially since after she gets all the 5C, 2C Uggies, she gets like six of them, and then can then do Shadow Rage and finish the combo and get like 9k. <laughs> It's so great. Yeah. So that is my jam. <laughs> so, do you have any plugs? Anything to I plug mean, going plugged. into? Um, let me think. Shout outs to anime. Shout outs to trying to learn Tekken 7. Yep. Um, uh, shout outs to ESG, Esports Gym. They're sponsoring me. Okay, I am. Cool. Um, I'll be at OHN. I'll be at. All future events for the foreseeable future uh, within Australia. Um, Excellent. Are you entering Tekken at OHN? Uh, you can. I am indeed. Yes. Cool. Um, check out. Yeah, uh, they got a Facebook page. Um, facebookcom slash gym. You can yep. just search it up. Uh, yeah. So we have meets on Wednesdays. Uh, Wednesdays is mainly Smash, but especially Sundays uh, is like the other fighting game uh, oriented day. Am I entering Persona at OHN? Yes, I am. Um, cool. Yeah, I think that covers it. What about you, Pitchy? So, for plugs, the first one is, this is the same week that the other Australian fighting game podcast is. I think I forgot to say at the start that this is the most listened to Australian anime fighting game podcast in the world. But, if you want to hear <laughs> the big boys of Sydney talking about Tekken, most likely since it's the show after Tekken's launched, and it's run by Mr. Tekken himself, Yusuf Fadul. So check out twitch.tv slash Gamra, G-A-M-R-A-H, on Thursday evening. There'll be an episode of I Don't Even Podcast This, where Gamra and Yusuf will probably talk about Tekken and be way more insightful about the intricacies that are specifically to Tekken on that time. And the other plug that I have is... Have you been to the Humble Store this week? Sorry? Have you been to the Humble no. Bundle Store, their regular storefront? No, no. Because it is Dejika Publisher Week. I will fire this up on the chat once I get rid of some text. There we are. Dejika Week, which means there's a bunch of games on sale. Now, some of these games are very cool. on Pachi Resurrection, Death Smiles, Mushihime Summer are all very good scrolling shooters. Crimson Clover World Ignition is an extremely good scrolling shooter, and it's a Dolgen game, so I've got to back it. That's two bucks at the moment. That is seriously one of the most fun scrolling shooters you'll play in ages. It's very, very Ray Force-y. There is the Umihara Kawase trilogy up there, which is some very clever, unconventional platforming. It's a game where you swing around with a fishing hook. Very fun experience, and the developer's dead, so respect their memory. There is Phantom Breaker Battlegrounds, which is not a very good beat-em-up, but it's $2.40. Mm, yeah. It's a reminder that you should be playing Phantom Breaker Extra, the greatest fighting game of all time. There's Darius Burst Chronicle Saviors. I disagree. <laughs> Dar well, we'll talk about Phantom Breaker <laughs> some other time. We've got Darius Burst Chronicle Saviors, which is not only a pretty darn good Darius game in an era where horizontal scrolling shooters are even more dead than vertical, that's a cool game. There's a 5 billion DLCs, including stuff like a Fantasy Zone DLC. That game's cool. More importantly, Blade Arcus from Shining Battle Arena is up there. 
which is not a very good game, but if you are, like me, a purveyor of games that are not very good, it's $12 US. But most importantly, Kohime Enbu is up there on the sale. 50% off Kohime Enbu. If you haven't played Kohime Enbu, if you like Street Fighter V, then Kohime Enbu is mechanically basically the game you should be playing. There is a lot of that up-close tension, but the conditioning and the rewards for conditioning people well are so much stronger and way more exciting. And the neutral game, there's stuff that will go through things like fireballs and the like, like Street Fighter V. And I didn't even talk about that facet of the game and why it drives me nuts. But the footsie game in Koihimi is really, really strong. There are ranges where you start to get in with crouching bees, and there's ranges where you get... Where you just got ranged buttons that check, but you've also got ranged buttons that will really hook you up big time, based on if you think the opponent's going to be continually being greedy and checking. So, Kohime Enbu, the net play is pretty darn good. I've had fairly good connections around Australia, and you know how terrible my internet is. It is a really good game, and I can't stress enough that if you like... There's a certain platonic ideal of what a footsie-based fighting game is, that people claim existed in the 90s, but it didn't really, except for, like, the last two weeks of Championship Edition. Kohime Enbu is well and truly that platonic ideal of a footsie-based fighting game with big rewards if you condition and read people right. So, Kohime is a cool game. Legendary Evo Blaze Blue champion Galileo plays Kohime Enbu. Check it out. <laughs> and we'll see you again in two weeks. When I do another show, my goal is... What is the topic is... of next... Yeah. So next time, if there's various events that allow for certain topics to come up, then we'll do them. Otherwise, my aim is to get an anime player who's learning injustice and have them on to talk about uh. why they're... How they're enjoying injustice so far, what attracts... And really what they find interesting and attracts them to injustice, because I, I don't think it's much of a secret that... As much as I don't like a lot of modern Capcom games, it is nothing compared to the burning hatred I have for NetherRealm Studios games. And I really want to get into the heads of people who like a lot of the games that I like. What it is that they enjoy about Ed Boon games that I just haven't been able to grasp. So in two weeks' time, we'll see you Sorry. around 8pm local time. Thank you, Giggles, for your time here. And we'll talk to you again after a while. I was just about to ask. Sorry, I was just before you, <laughs> before you close it off there. Yep. Um, uh, with the Injustice podcast, are you gonna grab someone who has played it a lot, or is just who's learning it? I want to grab someone who's learning it to see what they're finding exciting about the game. I mean, okay. if I want people who know know Injustice, then I'll just grab Sam Baxter, and he can rant about Batgirl fifty fifties off of a whiff punish from full screen. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Well. Alrighty, thank you for listening. We'll be on again in two weeks.